Hello, members. Good evening and welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, Emma and I's, uh, before I introduce Emma, Emma and I's favourite event to do, Friday Night Takeaway. Anything food and wine is right up Emma and I's street. So we hope that you are joining us as well this evening. A uh, few small bits of housekeeping, and they really will be tiny, but the event is billed from 7.30 till 8.45. Emma and I think that we'll probably be doing the main portion in 60 minutes, but of course it allows us a little bit of time to run over if we do have lots of questions. And on that note, please do submit questions to us. Um, we've got uh, two options. We'd prefer if you submitted your questions using the Q&A button, but of course there's two of us on screen tonight, so we can keep an eye on that chat. And if you do wish to use the chat to submit questions, then please feel free. The chat is also a great place for you to let us know what you think of the wines, what you think of the pairing. And I will be asking you in a minute uh, to submit something on the chat as well, if you would like to. Of course, everything this evening is all about a casual Friday night. Uh, poor Emma's had less of a casual. I, I looked at my phone a moment ago, Emma, to see whether it was Friday the 13th, because uh, Emma's Emma's got a screaming toddler that won't go to sleep or, or wants mummy to put her to bed. And I've managed to just put ketchup on my carpet, which my <laughs> husband doesn't know about just yet. Uh, so I did just check and say, is it Friday the 13th? But no. Uh, <laughs> but thank you, Emma, so much for joining this evening. A big cheers, the Champagne Queen. Uh, yeah, a big cheers. cheers. <laughs> um, I'm really looking forward to tonight and I hope that members are too. So without further ado, um, hopefully if you if you didn't receive the email, you will have guessed the lineup. Uh, we're going to start with the champagne, go on to the Riesling, then the rosé and then the red. So we are going through the colour spectrum this evening. And Emma will be um, talking about two of the wines. We'll both have a chat about the pairings and I'll talk about two of the wines as well. So if you have got all four wines tonight, please, please, please let us know what you're thinking. We'd love to get your thoughts. This is a really nice interactive session, but of course also being recorded. Uh, don't worry, your faces won't be on screen, uh, just Emma and I's, but it will be recorded due to uh, lots of members who are watching the rugby tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my husband said to me this morning, oh, um, would it be all right if I watched the rugby this evening? And I said, well, you're in luck. I've got an event mm -hmm. on and you get fish and chips. So <laughs> he's as happy as anything watching the rugby with his fish and chips. And I know that lots of other members are too. But thank you for those of you who joined us and are joining us live. And like me, uh, would rather have a glass of wine and learn about wine and talk about wine than watch the rugby. But ho-hum. Um, so I've got one little thing to do before I hand over to Emma to talk about the first wine. And that is that I would like to, uh, I'd like members to submit in the chat uh, if you have any regional delicacies. We've done this event once before and we found some absolutely amazing things coming out the woodwork. So I'll, I'll list a few regional delicacies we heard of last time, but also if you've got any local delicacies, if there's something at your fish and chip shop um, that's a real unique quirk, we want to hear about it in the chat. So um, battered haggis, for example, in Scotland or battered Mars bars, that's a bit of a classic one. Um, Cumbrian patty. My parents are from Cumbria and these sort of uh, deep fried Cumbrian patties. There's also a pasty supper from Belfast, not to be confused in any way with the Cornish pasty. Uh, instead, it's sort of a pink mixture um, that looks a bit like pork prawn cocktail, but it's meat, potatoes, spices, herbs, um, all pushed together and then battered and fried. So that's a pasty supper in Belfast. Um, and then my two of my other favourites are orange chips, which I think la on the last event, maybe Catherine or it might have been you, Emma, mentioned orange chips from the black country that are sometimes uh, seasoned with paprika. And uh, my absolute favourite, just because of the um, of the name of it, is uh, rag pudding or rag pie. Uh, which is minced meat, onions, uh, cooked in a suet pastry and then cooked in a cheesecloth, hence the rag. So um, interesting, <laughs> interesting that one. If you've had rag pudding, please let us know. I'd like to know what it tastes like. <laughs> yeah, I think it sounds really nice. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it's the cheesecloth that's confusing me. Um, the necessity yeah, I think of it. 
Hmm. Yes, it is very specific. <laughs> very specific. Well, there we go. So please put them in. We'll maybe read some out if we've got time uh, at the end of the session, because I'd love to hear those. Um, I love the quirks. I've, I've been scolded for some northern quirks before as well that I didn't get on previous events that Catherine tells me off for. So um, I'd like to hear about all the weird and wonderful things. We sadly don't have anything weird and wonderful here in Essex, um, but I have got a delicious plate of fish and chips. So. Emma, it's up to you to tell us about wine number Yay. one. I'm so excited. I know. Well, this I have to say, um, because somebody is saying that they've got the Castle Now. Um, Castle Now is their champagne. For me, it's any champagne with fish and chips or sparkling wine. It doesn't have to be champagne, although it is a Friday night, so we do deserve champagne. Um, so this one that we've got is the Jean de Poigny, um, which is also made by Castle Now as well. Um, it's... Um, so Chateau Castanel, Champagne Castanel is um, a group of growers. Um, it's a cooperative. It's over 100 years old, um, named after a first general, um, a French general in the First World, first world War. Um, it's in the heart of Champagne and Reims. And um, they've got access to fruit from 900 hectares of vines, but across 155 crews. So They've got an awful lot of choice um, with the base wines that they're putting together. This is um, the one I'm drinking, which I picked up from the Society this week, is the 2013 base. Um, so it is 43% Chardonnay, 35% Pinot Meunier, and 22% Pinot Noir. And um, it's a Premier Cru Champagne at a, as Sarah puts it, a party price. So um, it is a, every time I drink it, I think, God, that is actually really good. And I don't know why I don't drink more of it. But I always tend to go for the Society Champagne, but this is a really nice champagne. Um, it's got kind of lots of lemon, green apple, and it's still got a bit of that kind of um, creamy, biscuity, brioche note to it as well. So reason for putting champagne with um, fish and chips or sparkling wine with fish and chips, you need, it acts like the kind of, like the vinegar. It's the, the acid to what is otherwise, sadly, quite a fatty meal. I noticed I saw on the chat somebody was having um, mushroom risotto, but they assured us that it was still quite fatty. So I was like, good to go. Um, so bright, acidic wine, good fruit. And fish and chips love bubbles. So bubbles act in the same way that acidity does. They help to cut through any fattiness, which is why um, a lot of bubble, bub sweeter bubbly wines go so well with chocolate as well. Um, but that's a different workshop altogether. Um, so they cut through the, the potential, the kind of oiliness, but they also add a kind of little bit of delicate sweetness to fried fish as well. And um, I think it's a really nice combination. For me, it's quite a decadent combination I really like it how do you find it because you've got oh, the genre pointy as well I do you? I love it Emma I love that you've gone in with a bang to start mm -hmm. with as well why not go for a premier crew champagne with your fish yeah, and chips exactly exactly but it's also <laughs> it's not I mean it's not like we've gone for a 40 pound champagne which you know if anybody has got a 40 pound champagne yay I'll come around to yours next time but um <laughs> I think it's just there's something about it that makes it feel quite decadent I agree. And I think the really nice thing for me about champagne and fish and chips is 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 that oxymoronic sort of um, we did. I'll quickly tell a story. I actually have a photo of it, but it's right at the end of the presentation. So if we have time at the end on our mini moon in Wales this year, my husband and I did um, fish and chips and on the Welsh coast. And I packed the car with wine because I thought if we can, let's you let's use some wine society stuff. And I had a, um, oh, I'm about to forget what it was. It was a uh, um, Chateau Neuf de Pat Blanc. Um, I've forgotten the producer. The name has escaped me. But my goodness, it is so much fun to have something out of paper and out of a chip packet and then be drinking something sort of five times the price of your whole meal. Mm. And, you know, on the beach with sand in your toes. And, oh, it's just the best feeling in the world. That's, like you say, that decadent fun um, yeah. wine should be fun and it, it's good fun to have champagne and fish and chips and fish and chips when you've just got them out the packet and you're eating them on the pier or you know kind of on the street that you've just bought them from they they are just it's the best way to do it we got ours earlier because of um toddler 
and um, I've had to put them back in the oven and they they lose a little bit of that kind of in propriety that kind of special yeah we're just going to go for it kind of style so I love the fact that you um you sat on the beach of your Chateauneuf de Pat that's perfect yeah I think I sent him to go get the fish and chips and I had the chilled <laughs> the chilled wine ready opened let's go that's amazing. So. <laughs> you always were very organized though Anna so that's yeah when it when it comes to wine I uh, that's where my organization levels go up and up a notch no I think it's a fabulous match and members if you haven't tried champagne and fish and chips I think Emma's sort of got it in one we can all go home now <laughs> <laughs> um, for those people who've got fish and chips I always have mushy peas um it's for me fish and chips without mushy peas is just a very sad existence and that kind of slightly earthy greenness in the mm. in the mushy peas also bizarrely works with the champagne as well. So um, I know that mushy peas are quite divisive. There will be many people who will be hurling things at the screen right now. Okay, that's disgusting. But for me, it does work really well. So um, happy days. I totally agree. And I should say, members, please just eat away. Don't wait for Emma and I to, to talk too much. Otherwise, you will have the dreaded cold fish and chips, which we you know, we can't forgive, sadly. It's very sad. <laughs> <laughs> so on the note of mushy peas, I actually chose my wine, not just around mushy peas. I'm not that mad because um, I do know it's divisive. Um, and I apologise, the PowerPoint's going to come up a bit funny. I've done something rather odd, but there we go. Um, hopefully that's fixed itself now. Um, it's hard navigating the laptop over the chips. <laughs> um, but I picked the Paul Kluver Riesling um, and I picked it for a few reasons really and I, I'll maybe talk about the wine and then why it only sold out this morning so if you didn't manage to get your hands on it members I apologize I will find out if it's coming back in stock it was a really popular wine as you can see it's won a few awards um, but it was incredibly popular more so I think than we probably imagined I actually bought it personally first and then thought oh my this would go with fish and chips and here we are today <laughs> um but Paul Kluver is a lovely estate I just wanted to give you an example this is all the family and it's four generations of family who've been farming here in Elgin for over 120 years and for anyone who doesn't know um I'll just quickly flick onto a map Elgin is in South Africa and it's this um it's this purple region here, light purple, not dark purple. The dark purple is actually Franschuk and the light purple is Elgin. The only reason I wanted to show you a map particularly is you probably wouldn't expect it being this close to the coast. But actually, there's something really special that happens in Elgin um, or something very special about the place. And that is that it's really high up. Um, and I say really high up. It's really high up in terms of South African viticulture. So on average, these vines are about 300 to 400 meters. But it's actually an inland plateau, so it doesn't look very mountainous when you see it. But Elgin sort of sits almost like a big bowl. And what that plateau means is it's high up, so it's cooler, and it's close to the ocean. And even, why does that matter? You know, why do we care? Well, one of the things that it does to the wine being so high up and close to the ocean is it, it changes the growing season slightly. So you get this sort of, I wouldn't call it cool, cool, cool climate. You know, we're not talking German Riesling here, but it's certainly cooler. It's high up. So really, it gets really good sunlight interception. So the fruit ripens really well. But because the ripening season is extended, um, the grapes ripen much later in the season in autumn. You get this really big diurnal range. So you get warm, sunny days and much cooler nights. And because of all of this, the grapes development actually slows down slightly. So instead of getting really boozy and alcoholic and and um, yeah, sort of hot, the Riesling can actually really slowly accumulate all the flavors and aromas and it keeps the acidity. And one of the things Emma mentioned earlier about the bubbles is really key for the Riesling pairing for me. High acid with battered anything is just an essential. Um, and it's why Emma's champagne worked, but it's also why I think Riesling works. Um, and what you end up with is this wine with this great acidity, but they've actually even left a tiny bit of sugar in there as well. So there's about 16 grams of sugar. So it's not a sweet Riesling by any stretch of the imagination, but there's a tiny bit of residual. And the reason that I've mentioned that is because I actually really like that touch of sugar with the sweetness of mushy peas. 
and battered and battered fish can also be quite sweet you know there's a reason we cover it in salt and lemon and vinegar um there are some sweet flavors sort of buried under all of this and I think the sugar kind of works with that um the motto I like to think of with Riesling that this has this has achieved is for growing it slow and steady wins the race you know, you don't want to really cook your Riesling. It's not a grape that really likes that. So Elgin is an ideal place to do this. And really, um, there are only a few producers in South Africa making this quality of Riesling. It's just too hard to do. There's, there's too much heat and too much um, sun. But this particular little heaven in uh, Elgin works. So um, what does it taste like? Um, it's got that sort of... Um, floral thing which you get with a lot of Rieslings which is really lovely quite mineral um so I find that mineral note quite appealing with the sea salt um that sort of yeah not fruit um smells other than that definitely some citrus maybe some green apple it's bordering on lime blossom and limes rather than lemon but I'm gonna have a taste in a sec yeah, it's, it's a really sort of classic uh, New World Fruity Riesling style. So I'm going to have a sip. Mm. So hopefully, members, if you're tasting along, you see your mouth is watering loads. It's got really high acid. So that's what's going to work with the batter. But that touch of sweetness is something a bit different. Um, and to Emma's point earlier about the champagne having something that went with the mushy peas because of the herbalness there's a kind of green pea asparagus thing almost going on here that I think works as well um the only thing that's really challenging for me to pair with fish and chips is the vinegar and I'm not a hundred percent sure any wine ever goes with vinegar per se but I think one challenge of this particular wine is balancing that sugar and vinegar I've intentionally not put much vinegar on my chips because it does tend to do not horrible things but confuse my palate a bit when I'm having wine but there is some vinegar obviously in my favorite which is tartar sauce so I'm going to try that and see if that works Emma how's how um how about you are you, you well, I know you're a Riesling fan anyway yeah, yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> it's a lovely Riesling because as you say it is um it's got that really nice high acidity so I think for that reason it works really well it does have that touch of sweetness which in a way kind of counterbalances the the salt and the very the kind of savory notes that you might get and I was looking at the um the questions and somebody said um would your choice of wine differ if you were using tomato ketchup rather than salt and vinegar and I thought not a hundred percent I think that if you were putting curry sauce on your fish and chips, then you are quite, you are very much changing the dynamic and the flavor. Um, and then I probably would really go towards the Riesling, but um, having read the question and then tried the Riesling again, I went, I think that would really work with tomato ketchup. Um, yeah, I've got some it's ketchup, got that, shall I try it? Yeah, please do. And it's got that little bit of sweetness that you mm. get in tomato ketchup, but I mean, I don't eat a lot of ketchup, but it's also quite, it has a lot of spirit vinegar in it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that works for I me. I think that would really work. Um, I think with any, any pairing, there's always, you, you mentioned the vinegar, there's always going to be a little bit of a compromise somewhere. And um, so you're always going to be like, oh, that was really good. It's like when you, my mum's a classic for this, makes a new recipe and goes, uh, yeah it was good but I think I could have done with probably a quarter of a teaspoon less salt in it in the end and you're like yeah okay but it's trial and error so that's part of the fun of it so um my suggestion would be try as many different wines you've just got to have that high acid and then you can um you can just work out what works for you Absolutely. and then somebody else is asking about um the problem with Riesling is it goes through that really petrolly phase. What do you what do you do with it when it's going through that phase? And I thought, have it with ham. Mm -hmm. If you're not a vegetarian, it goes even when it's going through the petrolly phase, or re repurpose, rename the petrol, um, which um, 
Henschke in Australia once said, please don't call it a petrochemical. We're a biodynamic um, winery. <laughs> um, and they said, call it lime curd on buttered toast. Okay. And I was like, okay, yeah, I get it. So instead of petrol, think lime, lime peel. And then maybe you might go more towards your tie. <laughs> <laughs> I think as well, well, you know, <laughs> Uh, and also, if you really don't like the the petrol or diesel or, or gasoline, whatever you want to call it, thing that petrol uh, that petrol that Riesling can do, the best thing to do is just buy very very young Riesling, really, mm. because mm. you're much less likely to have it because it hasn't got to that developed note yet. Um, and I know that you know there's no hard and fast rule. Different Rieslings age at different speeds, so you can't predict. But the younger you buy it, the, the more likely you are to not have that and just to have the fruit and the flowers. So mm -hmm. if you're if it's something you just dislike, then I think it's something to avoid buying as well. Or, or go young. Yeah. Go um, young. Now I've just seen Linda has said that she's got battered scallops and the Riesling goes with them, and she said sweetness again. First of all, delicious. <laughs> I know. Um, did you do that yourself, Linda, or um, did you get that from your chippy? If it that's your I chippy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm putting the house up for sale immediately. I need to exactly. live near Linda. <laughs> We're off. <laughs> um, but no, battered scallops would be the ideal thing for this. And actually, I love Riesling with bat the, um, my, one of my favourite dishes in the world is scallops pea mint puree and bacon bits mm. um usually phrased more beautifully than that on a menu but that combination for me I would always pick a Riesling for that combo because you're right those scallops are very sweet um you know particularly if they're caramelized or that again the batter can be sweet so yes sweet scallops absolutely peas relatively sweet as well so you're starting to see where my idea to have a, a Riesling with a little bit of residual sugar came in Oh, it's lovely, lovely, actually. It's been a while since I've had the Paul Kluver, and it sounds like it's going to be a little while until I have it again. So I'll make the most of it now. But it's a really nice, re really good Riesling. Really well, pink. hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, there's some more scurried away somewhere, but I can't guarantee that. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, Other amazing readings, Rieslings are also available, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, before we move on to the next one, which I'm also going to take you through, which is the chapel down, I did want to quickly show members a one of my better. So I don't know why I didn't put um, my mini moon sooner, but one of my best fish and chips experiences is in South Africa. So it seemed opt to um, include it now. And I know that some members like to travel, so I cannot recommend highly enough in uh Hermanus which is in the Hemelinada region so actually if I show you on the map just to give you an idea uh it's in the little yellow bit so bearing in mind Elgin that we've just had our wine from is the purple and down in the yellow is probably my favorite fish and chip spot to date of my life um the photo on the left is, is is just one from their website but you can see that they what they do in the summer is they put all their tables out on the rocks and you can look out onto the rocks and this is a photo i took on the right i was actually drinking an ataraxia sauvignon blanc with my fish and chips then and i would say for all the reasons i picked a riesling in terms of flavor so floral um green fruits citrus fruits all for all of those reasons it was exactly the same reason I picked that particular wine there the Ataraxia Sauvignon Blanc and they do do battered fish and chips but they do big platters and all sorts um and to Emma and I's conversation earlier I actually don't think that there is anything better than eating fish and chips when you can see the sea that's true actually it has a whole new dimension at that point doesn't it yeah I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a new it's a completely different ball game, slightly different to my hallway in in Essex, but <laughs> <laughs> but at least the wines are delicious tonight. So, not that the ataraxia wasn't, of course. Um, so, on that note, um, I am going to move on to the Chapel Down, and uh, in particular, the Chapel Down English Rosé. Now, Chapel Down is. Uh, well, a very long standing producer of ours, but they're actually a really um, historic, probably the wrong, wrong wording, 
they are one of the originals or certainly one of the early adopters in the English wine scene. So their first vineyards were planted in 1977 and they often battle with Night Timber about who's the largest UK producer because you can argue it by volume or by value or by land. And I believe that volume and land, they are the largest at the moment. They are certainly one of the most successful Um, They produce a range of styles of wine. So they have a sparkling wine that we stock. They have sparkling rosé as well. They have a huge, huge range of of different kinds of sparklings. Um, They also produce uh, floral sort of aromatic white wines. They produce rosés. They produce the whole works. They even produce, and I'm not sure if it's still the most expensive, but certainly when I went to visit, it was the most expensive single vineyard Chardonnay, uh, Kitts Coty. And uh, it's an incredible wine. They are very very skilled producers with an incredible winemaker so um what I love about them is you can buy a 12 pound 95 rosé from them and then a 60 pound chardonnay um and they've got everything else in, in between as well so a brilliant producer showing exactly what can be done in the UK um I thought I'd show you this because this I actually only found this yesterday um I was looking for a I thought you might want to know where Kent was (laughs) I didn't really but I thought oh maybe I can find somewhere that shows you where the there are various infographics and things that show you where vineyards in the UK are but then I suddenly stumbled across this and this is commercial vineyards in the UK uh, with sort of like a decent number and that just does go to show how much wine is now being produced in the UK um, if you did want to know where Kemp was, <laughs> coincidentally, just down here, <laughs> down here on the on the southeast coast. Um, and one of the, the reasons that um, that they produce such lovely wine down in Kent is you've got a gorgeous warming influence from the English Channel. So it's no surprise that basically anything that covers the English Channel, uh, it produces wine of varying degrees of quality, I would say, but actually mostly good. Um, or exceptional from good to exceptional I'd say on that south coast and because they've got that warmth these are the sorts of producers that are starting to to make really decent red wine and that's not the same and you can't say that of the whole of the UK it was you start to get further up north sparkling and white wines um, sort of slightly lower alcohol aromatic white wines um, tend to take over but down here is where you can grow red grapes well and so this is where you're going to get things like your rosés and your red wines of course um i'll quickly show you i actually used a chapel down wine the other day so um this is their their site yeah sorry just to interrupt you one second um somebody is paul saying surely not all the green area on your map grows wine in the uk um oh to be clear it's the green they've made the cat i think they've made the counties or at least the like as in that's not vineyard space that's we've not been taken over by sort of the zombie <laughs> vineyard invasion um no it's not it's not the actual um map or Paul if you meant wine growing versus vine growing they all grow vines and produce wine um wine is produced in these or vines vineyards that produce wine here yes so there are vines grown up in Scotland they just don't make wine at the moment there's a gentleman trying to make wine up there so this is where commercial vineyards can be found. Um, and as I said, of varying degrees. And, and a lot of these sort of, a lot of the more northerly ones will just produce cellar door wines or, or something like that. So, um, yes, it does say that Hereford, Hertfordshire shows nothing. Now, I think that's not quite true anymore. I think Greater London has now got a vineyard. Don't hold me to that. But there's definitely a producer in London who we work with. Um, They are buying buying vines, buying grapes from all sorts of places around London. But I believe that there is now a um, commercial vineyard in Greater London. But I believe. Um, Now, this is a picture of the um, this is a picture of exactly where. So Tenterton, Tenterdon, where Chapel Down are based. I should, for clarity, make you aware that not all of the grapes come from Kent to produce this. Now, some of them come from uh, Kent, but some are from Sussex and some are from Essex, where I currently am. And the reason for that is that the soil types in all those places are slightly different. So down in um, 
down in Kent and Sussex, you tend to get more chalk soils. And then up in Essex, tend there are patches, obviously, but you tend to get more clay and loam soils. Clay and loam, again, tend. Uh, there's, a, there's a sort of movement or an understanding now that Essex uh, is going to possibly be better for red grape variety and red wine production. So I couldn't tell you exactly where each of the grapes are from, but just to let you know, they're, they're pretty spread out. Um, now, that is because there are actually eight different varieties that go into this blend. Um, I think I had the list up here. Yes, good. Uh, so Pinot Noir is the main grape variety in here for 57%, pardon me. And then we have, and I think I know the numbers for a few of these, um, the other red grapes, uh, Pinot Meunier, don't quite know how much. Um, then there's Pinot Noir Procose, and I'm not 100% sure on that either, but Rondo, I know there's quite a decent amount of Rondo that goes into here, 8%. Um, there is 4% uh, of uh, Regent. Uh, so there's quite decent numbers of those. Those are not perhaps your everyday grapes. They are grapes that have traditionally red grapes that have been growing okay in the UK. They've got Germanic blood, should we say. So they're used to cool climates. Um, but you'll see that there's a mix of red and white grapes. So we've also got our Chardonnay and we've got our Pinot Blanc. So this is actually a blend of red and white grapes which is quite interesting. And the reason I say that that's quite interesting is because uh, if you were having a rosé, say from Provence, you would only use red grapes and then you would press the grapes and the juice runs clear. But what you then do is allow the, you allow the skins to sit in with the juice, something called maceration. Now here, these, these wines are actually not macerated. Um, so this is not how you would make Provence Rosé, for example. What they actually do here is they um, whole bunch press the Pinot Noir, the Rondo and the Regent. And the juice that comes out of Rondo and Regent is actually really quite dark. So they're actually a grape that has dark innards as well as just dark skins um, and because of that when they blend it with the white wine then they get this amazing salmon color um, I think it's such a beautiful color so it's made completely differently to, to wines from from Provence or from the south of France that you're perhaps more used to um, but I think what because of all those eight, eight eight different varieties you get incredible complexity with Pinot Noir at the helm it's really full of berries so if you are having a sniff, I get a kind of mineral note, something a bit earthy. And that's, you know, it's also two years old, this wine. So it's got a bit of age. It's a real food friendly rosé. Um, you could sip it at a poolside if you wished. But for me, this is a food friendly wine. Um, you, we talked earlier about ketchup and I have to say I do think this wine goes with ketchup um there are, I wouldn't put it on a tasting note and I certainly wouldn't put it on the food matches document um but the reason I think it goes with ketchup is I find that sort of slightly slightly older and slightly gutsier roses from Spain and I know this isn't like for like but I do find that sort of um high acid but fruity forward Spanish Rosada style goes with tomato salsa and tomato based um, tomato based Spanish dishes, you know, when you have your patatas bravas and things. And because of that, I think this really works because what are fish and chips with ketchup other than English patatas bravas? So that's kind of why I think this works. And, and you know, the Spanish have been doing it for ages, Rosados and patatas bravas. And I'm, that's my plan and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I think you're spot on, actually. Um, I also think that rosé works just brilliantly across the board because it, it straddles that it's not white, it's not red, it's got the acidity, so it's kind of the best of both worlds, really. But then I'm a firm believer in rosé is for life, not just for Christmas, not just for summer. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's lovely. It's a really nice rosé. I like that it's gutsy. Hmm. I like that it it has punch and I think that that's a, a much better style of rosé for food pairing. I think with so many flavours on your plate with fish and chips, as with most foods, to be honest, unless you're having a, a very simple salad, those poolside rosés usually get overwhelmed. Um, mm -hmm. And unless you're doing something very light and delicate, then rosé tends um, 
to be the se- play second fiddle. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important to find a rosé that has enough guts and has enough, mm. you know, yeah, has enough going true. for it. And they exist. And gosh, Marcel Orford Williams buys enough of them, doesn't he, Emma? Oh, he certainly does. He certainly <laughs> does. And the, the Rhone, if you're not going England, then the Southern Rhone, as we both know, has a, a large amount of, um, of roses at all price ranges that mm. work really well. Um, it was interesting, actually, because I was looking... I was looking online earlier and um, Fiona Beckett has an amazing um, food and wine matching website. So if you're really interested in that kind of thing, have a look at her website. Um, but there was an, there had seemed to be some kind of argument going on between do chips, as in the kind of fish and chips, do the chips actually really make a big difference to your food and wine pairing? And she is going, they make no difference at all. And then other websites I was reading goes, "Mm, the chips are really important and they'll completely skew your food and wine matching. So I mean, we kind of sat here tonight looking at them going, no, I think I'm going down with Fiona. They're just, they're there in the background. The fish takes center stage. I'd be really interested to hear what members who are trying fish and chips or. Surely chips are a vessel for the sauce though. So Chips by their by the definition of the fact that you're then consuming the sauce are very important. If you're um a mad person and you have the chips by themselves, then maybe not. <laughs> no, you see, I'm a chips and mayo girl. Um but then my husband has just walked out having had chips and chipotle mayonnaise. Oh, okay. <laughs> With fish, that's gonna be really interesting. So um, I'll have to find out how it worked. I think the other thing um that I find interesting though, Emma, about the chips point is we had um Stefan uh, Newman on, who is the, uh, he's a master sommelier, an Austrian guy, and he really enlightened me as to uh, textures in food and wine mm. matching. And I have to be honest, it's not something I'd given a huge amount of thought to. But I think if you've got soft, flaky fish and then crunchy batter, you know, very, very delicate, the, the well, delicate and crunch, the density of the chips does add texture to your mouth so I think Mm -hmm. if you maybe I'm thinking now the Riesling for texture would be better because it's got a bit more mouth feel to it Mm -hmm. out of my two wines do you see what I mean that's maybe I probably agree with you that chips by themselves are not going to change the flavor of the dish but I do like the chat saying it's about what you put on them so tomato ketchup maybe not but curry sauce Mm -hmm. that's going to make a big difference and then um, somebody is saying um, that, oh, it's sorry, my eyesight's terrible. It's the kind of result of lockdown and too much computers. But um, Felix is saying that um, he has the salt and the vin- vinegar on his has made a big difference. It's the vinegar. Yeah. Um, and do sweet potato chips make a difference? Yes. <laughs> big time. Very <laughs> big time. That's chip. That's healthy. <laughs> Um, I have to say, if I if I were eating the sweet potato, the Riesling would again be racking up some points for me because of the sweetness. Sweet potato is so sweet. You know, when you when you actually break the food apart, there's a reason why all the health nuts make sweet potato cakes. It's sweet enough to make a cake from. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yes. But again, it depends if you're making sweet potato chips covered in chipotle or chili sauce. Perhaps not. But uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. So Felix is saying that the um, the Riesling, I'm thinking, he says there's something yogurt-like that disappears with chips and salt. So I'm presuming that he prefers it with the chips and salt. They prefer it with the chips and salt, Maybe. but um, we'll have to find out. But um, no, it's interesting how, as you say, it does, um, it does uh, yeah, likes it more with chips and salt. <laughs> Perfect. Salt can be quite a good friend for most wines. Oh gosh, yeah, it's yes. one of our um, wine and food pairing food friends. Food friend. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, lovely stuff. Thank you. Oh, I didn't really finish the tasting of my rosé, but I Sorry. think most people. Well, no, I I got overexcited. If I'm honest, but I think most people will probably find. I actually find the rosé quite creamy. It's funny you've said that about the yogurt. I find the rosé really, really rich and unctuous. Um, it's very full of fruits. I think there's a strawberries and cream feeling that I'm getting with it, but it's not mm-hmm. sweet. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a funny brain game. There's no residual sugar in here. So we're not we're not expecting. Well, there is a tiny bit, but not like the Riesling. If you go back, if you're tasting along, you'll definitely see that this is not a wine with sugar in it. But it has got this sort of classic British strawberries and cream rich thing going on that I love. So, Emma, I'll hand over okay. to you. I apologize. No, please don't. Um, so we're on to the final wine, which is the Zweigelt. Um, so I'll just talk a bit quickly about the Zweigelt and then I'll talk about the whole red wine and fish and chips, which is um, potentially potentially a tricky subject. Um, <laughs> so they, um, it's from fam- the Famille Mantler. Um, they describe this wine as being honest, down to earth, and good. And having tasted it, I, I have a tendency to agree with them on that. Um, it's from now, please do, I do apologize. My Austrian is um, horrendous. Um, Ibersbrunn is the home village. Um, it's 60 kilometers northwest of Vienna, um, and it's 25 kilometers from um, Krem in the Weinviertel region. It's very much a family affair. So it's um, the whole family, they live together, they work together, they farm sustainably, so there's no herbicides, no pesticides used at all. And um, they have 12 hectares, lots of different sites, lots of different soils. Um, Their reds are fermented in stainless steel, and then they are kind of cool, cool age so it's nice chilled out literally chilled out cellar in um for this wine in large oak vats um we first got this wine with the previous vintage which was friday i think at the time it's been two Mm. of the series range and in 2021 it was a wine champ and it went down so well that freddie actually approached the winery and said can we can we start doing your wine on a more regular basis? And they're like, yeah, that's cool. Um, so the reason I was a bit kind of mm, with the red wine is because red wines are more tricky to pair with something like fish and chips. And it's it's not fish. It's the fact that it's battered fish and chips um, because tannins can react with the, the iron that you have in the fish and the, the, the oil, and they can create this kind of, slightly metallic taste to them um and they can if you go for two full body to red so to flip what Anna was saying about her mini moon on its head um were you to have gone with a shut enough to pack red you would have found that the the red wine would have just completely have overpowered the fish you just they're both lovely on their own but together they end up having a bit of a fight um so there's no there's no point in it um so the the way around this is to pick a really light delicate red that's got very low tannins and um a decent amount of fruitiness to it so this wine when you smell it and try it it's kind of quite it's got a little bit of that kind of pure black currant fruit a little bit black pepper but there's also a lot of freshness to it as well and um a little bit of spice there as well. So that kind of opens up. I poured mine a little while ago um, and then just topped it up just now. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's kind of, it really is opening up in the glass. And I think it's, I think it's interesting with the fish and chips. It's, it's for red wine lovers. I, I actually love it, Emma. I really, really like it. I think it's a fab pairing. Thank you. You see, champagne is always my go-to, but I like I like this. It's um, but I think because it's not too not too full-bodied, not too spicy. But I'd be interested if anybody's got this or another red wine. I would be really interested to find out, you know, what they thought of the pairing, how that worked for them. But um, yeah, I mean, I think generally. With fish, and, I mean, with with fish, generally, there's so many different fishes out there that you can, you pick the weight of your fish and you pick the weight of your wine. But um, with fish and chips, which tends to be pretty much cod, paddock, skate wings, um, in my neck of the woods anyway, which is Bedfordshire, um, 
you have to go for something that's quite light and fruity. So Beaujolais, Vigelt, anything like that, really, that's got decent acidity again as well. It was funny. I was as I was tasting it, I was wondering whether a Beaujolais would go to because it has mm. that sort of similar, lovely fresh tart berries. Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm honestly stunned at how well that goes, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> and just to prove the theory I did actually <laughs> members might have seen me I don't know I did just take an entire piece of only batter <laughs> um, which was delicious and I thought oh I um I'll see if my um I'll see if my batter only you know the oily I'll see if I get that sort of bloody irony thing and actually I didn't at all and it's so oh, interesting really that yeah that's really good somebody's saying or oh, a very light pinot yes um I would, with oiliness, I would make, I would, it's all personal taste, but I would go for a pinot that's got a little bit of what I call a fruit duvet. Mm. So um, don't go for a pinot one. that's too skinny. Um, and I would probably go um, go with something like a Chilean pinot, um, a decent amount of fruit, and not too serious. Because I find the more serious you go, the more, the less fruit you have and the more kind of um, tertiary, secondary and tertiary characteristics there are going on. Apparently the mantler goes particularly well with um, the ketchup. Yeah, so, I totally agree. Maybe that's why I had I had ketchup on my batter as well. It was blinking lovely. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to have to write a piece on wines that match with ketchup. I feel this is coming on. <laughs> I think so. And then Andy, Alison, Tony and Sarah have said the red wine goes with the battered sausage as well and mm. agree the sausage meat in a battered sausage is often it has a bit of sweetness to it. I couldn't agree more. I actually must confess my husband stole um, the battered sausage before I got a ch- chance to put it on my plate. So I haven't got mine this evening, but if he's left me any, I'm going to go and try the um, try the mantler with that. Mm. I was hoping as well that the Riesling would go for the reasons that um the the sausage meat that does go into them is almost quite Alsatian those sort of thick um Germanic quite finely ground sausage meat you know it's not um it's not a Cumberland sausage usually that you deep fry um it's more of a sort of fat frankfurter so um I certainly think that Riesling particularly Riesling from Alsace but I thought that Riesling might go well with that as well for those reasons and then completely it's like well completely off piece um Sauternes. Oh, yes. That might be worth a try as well. If you just happen to have an open bottle of Sauternes in your fridge. Um, again, the you have to be careful that the Sauternes won't overpower. But with a battered sausage, I think that could be really interesting because it's got that really high acidity and the salt sweet. So, I'm glad you mentioned that, Emma. That was going to be my question to you before we went on to any member questions. <laughs> my question to you was going to be, what have we missed from this list? So, so Ooh, sherry, 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 sherry is the, probably the big one that we've missed off. Um, we could have done any fino, very chilled, or any manzanilla would have been perfect with um, with fish and chips. It would have been really, really good. We did a sherry, sherry food and wine pairing the other last week I think it was and mm. um, that with fish and chips was just brilliant um so that would have been good but otherwise yeah possibly so turn but so turn with the sausage rather than so turn with the um fish and chips because <laughs> that would be weird <laughs> I think the nice thing about the sherry that I do love and I agree we maybe have to do a sherry and fish and chips one evening but um the sherry I love the sort of it adds the salt so you almost don't even need to salt your chips or salt the fish. The sherry brings the salt for me for a fish and chips. And it just, oh, it does everything. Yeah, it does. It's kind of, it's got the salt, it's got the savoury. Um, we can't talk too much about it because obviously we didn't put it on. But we'd have been here all night if we'd gone through every wine that we think likes the fish and chips. So we had yeah. to limit it somehow. <laughs> So my other one that I would have liked to include if we hadn't got so many limitations, i.e., time but also wine that one can consume of an evening Um, (laughs) I would also really have liked to nod back to where fish and chips came from so um 
it's believed that fish and chips may have come from Portuguese um, migrants in the 16th century, sort of on the Portuguese coast, even even more so today, you can walk up and down the coast and battered fish is such a, a staple part of the culture. And so we supposedly may have nicked the idea of battered fish from the Portuguese. And I think we've got a few Portuguese whites in stock that would have actually been really lovely. Not only something like a, a vino verde, but I actually think we've got a few sort of slightly smoky indigenous Portuguese whites that I think I would have liked to have tried. Um, so we've got ammunition for another event, Emma, that's for sure. Oh, I think we definitely do. I think we definitely do. And I was just thinking, actually, I mean, again, it's back to any medium or light white with high acidity. I've got a Godello in the fridge from the other night. That would be lovely. Which is not Portuguese, it's Spanish, but that I think that would work as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Your well, list is endless for a Friday yeah. night. <laughs> well, I think when it comes to fish and chips, it probably is. Um, I'm going to quickly show my photo because I do have it up here. It was a View Telegraph, of course it was. Um, <laughs> that, so that is my second favourite fish and chips I've ever eaten in terms of location, wine pairing. And yes, that is a plastic wine glass. <laughs> <laughs> the only way why Chateau Neuf de Pape should be consumed. Um, Absolutely. And, <laughs> and the other thing, these are, um, this was going to be, it was a double whammy because it was going to be my regional addition uh, to the question. And I was then going to have a look at some member ones. But these were deep fried mackerel. In mm. and they were absolutely delicious so yeah. they were just I don't know why they look so fat there uh, oh actually sorry I tell a lie the deep fried mackerel were in this little box here mostly already consumed before the photograph was taken but they were absolutely amazing so deep fried mackerel was going to be my quirk even though it was from mm. the Welsh coast and not from from around me but that was going to be my quirky thing and um, did you spot any quirky member member um that you liked I particularly like Ken Randall's haggis pakora yes that is good but um I lived in Glasgow for 10 years and I've had haggis pakora once gorgeous absolutely gorgeous it really I mean haggis is a very versatile um dish meat um, <laughs> put together thing um so yeah oh I was quite jealous when I saw that lovely really lovely but um interested so that would be with the Riesling I, I would say so yeah I guess some Riesling's a good one a little bit of sweetness well. to it would be really nice but um yeah um I don't have I mean gosh I live in Bedfordshire there's not what a massive amount. So it's just the only thing I always insist upon is my mushy peas. And if there's no mushy peas, then I do tend to take a grump. But um, otherwise, no, a batter sausage every now and then, but nothing exciting, I'm afraid. Nothing out of the ordinary. Exciting. Now, whenever we go to Norfolk, we just have the most beautiful fish and chips and they're absolutely gorgeous. And I go, I really want to move here. I really need this wine society <laughs> to move to Norfolk so we can all live there. But um, no. No, I'm afraid not. Afraid not. So we need to talk about scraps, which I love. My mum's from Yorkshire, so um, she loves scraps. Um, she's like, that's the best bit. <laughs> I have to say that's my real sadness for Bar Fish and Chip Shop. Everything else they do is fantastic, but their chips, it's almost as if they want the perfect chip. I want the imperfect chip. I want the pure, battered, been there for days scraps. Um, they're almost too good and too clean. Um, oh, you can't have a clean chip. <laughs> <laughs> and that leads me on to my final question before uh, we just check whether there's any more member questions. But do send them in, members, now whilst I quickly quiz Emma, because I know how partial she is to mushy peas. And this is a make or break for me. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. With your mushy... How, how do you feel about peas that haven't been mushed? Just straight up peas with your fish and chips. Um, sad. <laughs> My husband hates mushy peas. Absolutely hates them. And in spite of that, I married him. But um, so he's like, that's the way peas should come. When they crush, when restaurants crush peas and pretend that they're mushy, I'm like, that makes me sadder. 
But um, no, we just have, we just do two sets. So I have my chippies, my fats, you know, soak them overnight, all the rest of it. Then, you know, fish and chips are not just a kind of off the spur of the moment thing. But um, yeah, he has fresh peas and I'm like, oh, I like <laughs> peas, but mushy peas with fish and chips are where it's at. How about you? Yeah, I am, I am a mushy my pee has to be mushy I also just hate chasing a pee around the plate with a fork it's an absolute waste of my time (laughs) it's much more scoopable I can scoop mushy peas up with my chips and that's what you want (laughs) absolutely absolutely although you should do what my grand does which is just like literally smash them (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> smash them up smash them oh. <laughs> <laughs> well members do do send in any more questions i think we've managed to answer most of them as we go emma which mm. is very very good um oh so simon said what's the fifth wine you would have recommended tonight if there had oh. been time so emma if you're going to put your flag to the mast i don't even know if that's i think it would have been the sherry yeah and a, um, a particular I think, oh. I think it would have been, I don't know what stops are like this, so I'm kind of, oh gosh, um, I think, I think I'd have gone for something like a Manthania, um, and the kind of first one off the top of my head is something like the La Gitana, or something, you know, one of those, just a really salty, briny, um, light Manthania, I think would have been, would have been really nice, but you know but there are also so many others that would be input as well so i've popped a link in the chat members if you want to oh. look around for a few <laughs> manthaneas we've got a few at the moment that um that emma would recommend now i have a particular wine i would recommend and i'm really worried it won't be on sales <laughs> so <laughs> um which is actually a particular portuguese white um so just gonna have a quick look for it but the manthania i think the nice thing about those wines in particular emma is um without meaning to be too mean you couldn't really go wrong um with any of those manthanias they're all going to do the job it's the there isn't enough variation i suppose you could say but really what i mean is they they all tick the right boxes yeah yeah, I, I when you said about meaning to be mean, I was like, oh, what are you going to say? <laughs> so the wine I was going to recommend is actually out of stock. Um, so I won't recommend that one. But in the essence of being Portuguese, I would say that a very, very affordable alternative would have been the Society's Vino Verde, um, which I think is really easy drinking and lovely. Or, and we haven't even mentioned this wine yet, Emma, but I think I would also recommend to members a Muscadet. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. I think I'm going to pop in the chat for anyone who wants to know one of my favourite Muscadets. Um, and then I will leave it at that because my Portuguese wine isn't, isn't for sale at the moment. Yeah. Um, but I would strongly suggest, where are you? Here we go. Domaine de Rete. Uh, Muscadet which is an absolutely delicious wine um, it's low stock so if you did want to try some then uh, then you must but all of the reasons that Emma and I have talked about for lots of the other wines are why it works so things like it's slightly salty slightly saline um, it's got a bit of the the flavors of the lees that Emma's champagne had it's got the high acid that the Riesling had um, it does all sorts of things also, it's back to what goes together, grows together. It's right on the coast or on the kind of mouth of the sea. So, yeah, it works. It's it a good works. shout, actually. Also, it's avoid deep fried oysters if you. If, you if, you're, if your local <laughs> fish <you're> shop does, <laughs> does deep fried oysters, then you should go for a muscadet. And if it does do deep fried oysters, please do let us know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> there might be an influx of us moving towards your area (laughs) oh fabulous well thank you so much um i really really enjoyed this evening i can't wait to finish the rest of my wines i'm going to put my mantler back because i am going to go back to emma's champagne which i have to say still (laughs) continues to be my favorite um i really don't think you can beat it um, there is nothing better in the world than, for me than champagne and fish and chips, apart from maybe champagne and chicken nuggets. Which <laughs> <Good> <laughs> so, 
Emma, thank you for choosing a champagne. I'm really thrilled. Um, what was your favourite just before we sign off? Oh, I really like the Riesling. There we go. We've done a swap. <laughs> yeah, we have. I mean, I always, I knew I was going to like the champagne. The champagne's just so classic. Done. Um, but yeah, so, so many, oh, so many this near and they're whippy, lucky things. And so they get deep fried oysters there. Um, so yeah, so um, the Riesling's really good. It was my kind of, oh, of the night, um, which is, I think, quite exciting to do. So yeah. thank you very much. And um, somebody said, um, I think it was John said, it was nice to spend the evening with um, fish and chips and wine. And I would like to echo that sentiment and say, it's been lovely to spend the evening with you all. And um, thank you to listening, guys. <laughs> thank you all. Cheers.